And we're going to read God's word. Our reading comes from 1 Thessalonians, the first letter of Thessalonians, chapter 3. And I'll read down, I believe, to verse 12. It's that up on the screen, or if you want to follow in your own Bibles, that's fine. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For ye yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith, for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labour would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you, for this reason, brothers, In all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? As we pray most earnestly night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus, direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. What a a beautiful uh, pastoral prayer that is. It's not what I'm going to preach on tonight, but uh, that's how we should be praying for one another as we uh, seek God's blessing, praying Great prayers, important prayers, uh, and uh, prayers of increasing in love and abounding in it, focused upon the Lord Jesus. Well, as I said this morning, I prepared this message before the announcement last evening by uh, the government about the impending lockdown that we are facing. Uh, And uh, it is, uh, in my mind, uh, wonderful to see how the Lord brings his word in a relevant way to us. The Lord is um, passionate about feeding his sheep. And even if I'd known what we were facing this coming week, I think I would still be preaching this same message. So living in hard times, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, 1 to 8. What do you do when your world caves in? How does a Christian respond when hard times come? How can we keep our faith strong? How can we continue to cope with continued COVID as we face further limitations and restrictions? And um, that's going to be for a month, maybe longer. We're in the Lord's hands in what we are facing. We face these questions as we we go through trial and test. And not only is it about COVID, but it's about the the many issues that many of you are facing on top of that or alongside it. And we're all being tested, we're all being refined, and in many ways it's exaggerated in these days. 
So we've got our own struggles, sometimes deep struggles, and then on top of that is, is COVID. What we are about this evening is the worship of God. It's the submitting to his word. It's the capturing of our hearts afresh with a perspective change of the great plan and purpose of the living God that he has for us. We seek to see our hope and faith strengthened, our love increased, our walk before the Lord and each other, walking in a consistent way that is worthy of our calling. In other words, tonight really, really does matter. Tonight's worship is meant to shape and mould and challenge and encourage us to be people of faith. And people of faith in difficult states. I remember one of my lecturers in Bible college, a godly man, he was loved by his students very much. And I always remember something very profound he said, and I'm going to put the quote up here. When hard times come, be a student and not a victim. Now, I've got no idea whether that quote was original to him, but it stayed very much with me over 20 or so years since I heard that statement. It's, it stayed with me, and it is profoundly poignant. What did he mean? Well, we are not to live constantly feeling that we are victims, that we are mistreated, that we live with a perpetual victimhood in our life and in our thinking, and that we become self-focused in how we view life, and we learn nothing from our trials. So what does that actually look like? What does the difference between a victim and a student, what's that look like in everyday life? Well, a victim says, why did this happen to me? A student says, what can I learn from this? What is the Lord teaching me in, in these times? A victim blames other people for his problems. A student asks, well, how much of this trouble did I bring upon myself? Are there things I need to change to make things better? A victim looks at everyone else and cries out, life is not fair. A student looks at life and says, well, what has happened to me could have happened to anyone. A victim believes his hard times have come because God is trying to punish him. A student says, well, the hard times I'm facing is because God is shaping, refining, molding, and transforming me. A victim would rather complain than find a solution. A student has no time to complain because he's looking to the Lord for gracious intervention. A victim has such a self-focus that they've got no time for others. A student focuses on helping others instead of the self-focus. A victim begs God to remove the problems of life so he may become happy. A student has learned through the problems of life that God alone is the source of true joy of life and reality. That's the true Christian position. We believe very much in the sovereignty of God. And when hard times come, we believe that God is at work for our good and ultimately the glory of his name. And in 1 Thessalonians 3, Paul gives a shining example of his dear pastoral concern for these people. And he teaches us some very important things about our trials. Let me list the, the main things that we can learn from our passage this evening. Number one, our trials are unsettling. Look what he says in verses one through to three. He expresses his deep concern, so concerned for the Thessalonians as they were facing trial and persecution. He sends Timothy, who was a, a key fellow worker, 
And Timothy would have been useful to Paul in in Athens, but he sends Paul there uh, to Thessalonica to find out how things are, because Paul is aware that trials, afflictions as he calls them, are very unsettling. Now, two key words in the passage, uh, to be moved or unsettled is the Greek word that is behind the wagging of a dog's tail. It's talking about movement away from a position like that earthquake in in Turkey over the weekend. Did you see the, the buildings collapsing? There was that unsettledness of the foundations. And that's what Paul is worried about, that the moving away through afflictions. And that Greek word is the Greek word that talks about intense pressure under the thumb, as it were. Now, some here tonight have experienced unrelenting pressure from circumstances that may keep you awake at night. It saps your strength during the day. And these last seven months have been difficult. Yes, the Lord's been at work, but yes, they've been difficult times for us. You felt perhaps unsettled, moved by the pressures that you felt. And to make it Worse, just last week we had an extra hour in 2020. Imagine that. And the Word of God, we understand, knows that we will face these things. God knows that we will face these emotions. And so, within our passage tonight, Paul is aware that afflictions and trials can be unsettling. And no one is exempt from difficulties in in this life. You and I are either going through difficult times right now, some of you very intense trials, or we will face them in the future. And so we see the relevance and the importance of this message tonight. And what we need to understand is you particular trial doesn't matter. Now, I'm not saying that in an uncaring, uh, totally inappropriate pastoral way. Let me finish the sentence. Your trial doesn't matter as much as how you respond to it. That is a very important thought for us to grasp tonight. Often we focus intently on the details of our difficulties But what is crucially important is how we respond to what we are being called to face. Why do I say that? Because most of the time, we can't choose the the bad things that we are facing. None of us would be choosing to face lockdown or COVID times. We don't choose them, but we are held accountable for how we respond to them. It's very important that we understand that. We can respond in faith or unbelief, in humility or in arrogance, in forgiveness or in anger, in hope or despair. And often trials come with very little warning. They crash into our lives like a great tsunami tidal wave. I just think of that one day in Job's life where everything changed and he lost everything. He lost his wealth, his status, his family taken away. What a day that was. And yet, the Word of God appreciates the the painfulness and the bitterness of trials that we face. 
And despite those realities, James 1 verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, you can't count trials a joy if you just focus on the trials themselves. But if you focus upon the living God, then it's possible to live and breathe that biblical reality. Even in the testing times of life, you can know joy. Secondly, our trials are appointed. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. We are destined. That's a very loaded term there, isn't it? It's the word that means to put into place, to arrange. I don't know if you've ever watched anyone building a wall, but there's a great skill in get, getting the wall straight and, and plumb. There's an ordering of the bricks. That's the kind of word that's being used here. It's a very strong way of saying that these hard times are planned by God. They don't happen by accident. In fact, it's the opposite of chance or circumstance. It is arranged and planned. Our trials are planned. There are no accidents, friends. There are incidents, yes, troubles, yes, heartaches, difficulties, yes, disappointments, loss, failure, but no accidents, no random out-of-control events that come upon us. Let's lay hold of this great truth tonight. There are no accidents with God. Only incidents that are appointed by him for our good and his glory. That's the air that we continually need to breathe in these COVID times. The providence of God. So let me show you the finest statement I know of the, the, the providence of God. What do you understand by the providence of God? What's the answer to that question? It's the Heidelberg Catechism. This is such a great statement. God's providence is his almighty and ever-present power, whereby as with his hand he upholds heaven and earth and all creatures, and so governs them that leaf and blade and rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, health and drink, sorry, food and drink, health and sickness and COVID, riches and poverty, indeed all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Everything that happens in the world is caused by God. And he oversees and overrules. Nothing just happens. And nothing is outside of his control. So as we face whatever we are facing personally or nationally tonight, we do so by looking to this great God, seeking him for peace, having a, a hope and a rest in him, because that is available for us this evening. With that important understanding, let me bring you to my third point. Our trials are necessary. So verse 4 of our passage, for when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction just as it has come to pass and just as you no. So Paul was, was honest with these people. He said to them that they, with the apostles, were going to go through difficult times. This was an honest realism. We can't really respect the person who goes around singing, don't worry, be happy. Paul 
he was anything else, was an honest preacher of the word of God. And every rose has its thorns, and we realize that, don't we? Life is like that in this world. It's interesting what Romans uh, 5 says about life in this world. Uh, Again, these remarkable words, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, if I were to ask you tonight, do you want hope? I'm sure you would say to me, well, absolutely. We are meant to be people of hope. We are meant to uh, have hearts that pulse with hope. But Paul is saying that in order to have hope, we've got to have the sufferings, the afflictions. We rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Knowing that our sufferings produce endurance that eventually lead to hope. And that is the Holy Spirit filling our hearts with an eternal hope that does not disappoint. Let me give you some um, homework for this lockdown week. Memorize this verse, Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you you may abound in hope. And as we abound in hope, we have a steadfast confidence that the Lord is at work to bring his kingdom. We need to remember that our trials are not entirely negative. They may be a fact that the Lord is powerfully at work in our lives to mold and to shape us. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says this very helpfully, when trouble comes, Christians often re- react by doubting that they are where God wants them to be. They often think that they've done something wrong and that God must be displeased with them. Even some mature Christians react this way, as evidenced by Paul's words to reassure Timothy. Many years later, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yet storms often come to believers to make them able to stand firm rather than to blow them away. So there is a purpose. There is a divine purpose in all that we are facing, including the difficult times. But let me come to my fourth point, and it's really important that we appreciate the next point. Our trials are dangerous. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, so he's pastorally concerned about these people, I sent to learn about your faith. Why did he do it? Why did he want to know how they were? For fear that somehow the tempter, that's the devil, Satan, had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. That the pressures, the trials, the persecutions they were facing would overwhelm the the young faith of the Thessalonian church. And it is a very clear point that our enemy seeks opportunity to tempt us in difficult times. Satan wants us to fall away, and Paul knew this to be a real dangerous possibility. And that's something that we need to be aware of in this second lockdown. These can be dangerous times for you and me, spiritually speaking. We are continually told, aren't we, to keep safe, keep safe physically, but no one on the news warns you to keep safe spiritually. Well, 
that's my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the, the preacher of God's word. How does the devil tempt us in hard times when he works on a number of levels? Firstly, he may tempt us to doubt God's goodness. He whispers in our ear that the Lord doesn't care. Or he's forgotten us. And ultimately, the Lord isn't good in his character. And then he tempts us to retaliate against others with anger and resentment. And that's one of his favorite tools when hard times involve problems with people close to us as part of our family or part of our church. And then thirdly, he tempts us to discouragement and despair. What is the point? It's never going to get better. And as I said, we've just had an extra hour in 2020, and that's the last thing we need. The trials that we face lead, can lead to despairing thoughts. And none of us are immune on a spiritual, emotional level. And we, we need to be aware and, and honest that maybe in, in, in this second time of lockdown, you, you may struggle and it may be difficult for you. And Paul really feared that these Thessalonians, these young believers, would, would crumble under the strain and stress that they were facing. Hard times can wear us down. We lose our joy, our focus. We feel the weight of the pressure upon us. Is there, is there comfort? Is there help? Well, yes, there is. And again, I turn you back to the Heidelberg Catechism with these very precious words. Our trials are dangerous, but what is your only comfort in life and death? There's the answer. That I'm not my own, but I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. I belong to him. That's the testimony of the believer. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. We saw that this morning. And has set me free from the tyranny of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation. And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live and to him. I cannot find a more comforting statement outside of the word of God to think upon this evening. That's our comfort, that Jesus has died, that we might be set free. And let's be on our guard. Our trials are dangerous. And these are dangerous times for us spiritually. Let's resolve to be aware of our enemy and to look to the Lord. My final point is this. Our trials are productive. Verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith, good news that these believers are standing firm and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we've been comforted about you through your faith. I think we would all be comforted in these difficult days if when, God willing, we return in a month or so of time, or maybe longer, the Lord knows, that we see real growth and development amongst us spiritually. The Lord can do that. The Lord has done that. I've seen those within this congregation change in these Difficult days. We have faith in the living God. That means faith in God's character. He is good 
and he makes no mistake. We have faith in God's word. It is true no matter what happens to us. We have faith in God's purpose. He's conforming us to be more like his son, the Lord Jesus. We have faith in God's promise. He will never leave us or forsake us. We have faith in God's presence, that he is with us. Even in the, dark, the darkest moments of life, we have faith in God's power, that he can deliver us from every temptation. And Paul can honestly praise God for his sustaining hand upon these Thessalonians. And if the Lord sustained this young, immature church, then we must be convinced he can sustain us together, dear brothers and sisters. The Lord Jesus is real and he is precious. The wonderful thing about uh, the character of our, our God is that his grace is unlimited. You know, those great verses from Lamentations 3, we know them well. Praise God, the Bible doesn't say that the Lord's mercies are new once a year. No, it doesn't say that. It says his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. There is grace for you today. There's grace for you tomorrow. Praise God that Jesus is our Emmanuel, God with us. And that's not just because once he meets with us, but because he's continually present with each one of us. And even in the mundane, the ordinary moments of life, Jesus is there, our Emmanuel. That means tomorrow morning in the workplace or in the home environment or in the trial and test that you are facing, Jesus, our Emmanuel, there with us. Throughout this coming week, he's delivering us in every redemptive promise he's ever made. Even in the unremarkable moments, he's working to rescue, redeem, to mold, to shape, and to lead, and to guide. By his sovereign grace, our Lord will place you in a thousand, maybe ten thousand different moments this coming week. And in each one of those moments, big or small, he will be with you and his grace will be sufficient. These moments are made to take you beyond your character and your own resources and to provide you with a wisdom and a grace and a power that comes directly to you through the Holy Spirit that leads you to the Saviour. In this lifelong process of being changed, he's at work. And therefore, as we face whatever we are facing, we look to our Emmanuel, our ever-present Saviour, and we rest in him. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Let's trust Jesus, our Emmanuel, and he will meet us. Well, I will leave some time for discussion, but let's close this part of our service off by um, hearing this great hymn, O Father, You Are Sovereign. Again, as the hymn is played, please stand and listen to it, respond in your hearts. Thank you that you are trustworthy and you are faithful. 
and we look to you, O oh Lord, uh, as uh, we face this coming week, these coming weeks. We do so knowing that Jesus is our Emmanuel and he is with us. Would you sustain us and keep us and bless us, we pray, and bring your kingdom purposes. May we see you at work in these difficult days. May you preserve and protect us, and may we be found looking to the Savior and knowing his great and gracious presence. May we hunger and thirst after righteousness, and may we know uh, grace for every moment of every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>